The X-Men's Muir Island Saga is a less frequently discussed early 1990s crossover most commonly seen as propulsive tissue driving toward 1991's X-Men No. 1 relaunch and the penultimate transition of the Chris Claremont era of X-Men to the Jim Lee, Wills Portacio et al. era beginning in full. Indeed, if you look at Marvel's X-Men milestone trade collections, the Muir Island Saga is not even included. Nonetheless, it's a fascinating time period for Marvel's mutants, an intriguing culmination of Chris Claremont's plans for the Shadow King and a crossover with some shockingly relevant connections to the Krakoa era of X-Men. Today I'll answer, what are the essential X-Men comics to read during this time period? What is 1991's Mirror Island Saga and what's its impact on characters like Shadow King and Moira today? What's Legion's role in this saga? Plus some theories and predictions for what's to come in current X-Men comics. Hey everybody, I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. Thanks for listening to Crack and Krakoa number 185. If you like the comic Comic Book Herald YouTube channel, please consider liking, subscribing, sharing, and commenting. It all helps me out a great deal and encourages me to keep making videos like this. You can find full X-Men and comic book reading orders on comicbookherald.com with links in the show notes, including uh, guides to the current ongoing Dawn and Reign of X comics, as well as the Chris Claremont era of X-Men comics with the full guide on the site. Some spoilers for the Mirror Island saga will follow. I will try not to spoil some of the new 2021 stuff, but I will be talking a little bit broadly about what is happening there. So if you're totally on familiar with, for example, House of X and Powers of Ten. Um, I will try to put some warnings up front as we go through this. The build to Muir Island is honestly a long time coming, beginning in the gap years between 1989's Inferno event and the 1991 X-Men number one relaunch by Claremont and Lee. All sorts of mysterious pieces are laid out during this build, most notably a consistently brash and changed Moira, and the development of the Shadow King inhabiting the body of FBI agent Jacob Rice, second in command to Freedom Force governmental mutant liaison Valerie Cooper. Up front, the fact that the Muir Island Saga is a light crossover between Uncanny X-Men 278 to 270 and X-Factor 69 to 70 is a bit deceiving, as there's actually a much lengthier Shadow King saga in play across a wider stretch of preceding issues. I really think Muir Island reads a lot better with this context and Claremont's building, or at least it certainly did for me. Truly, you can see plenty of the build both in Claremont and Lee's debut of Gambit in Uncanny X-Men 266, or even in the Louise Simonson Rob Liefeld work, debuting Cable on New Mutants 87 to 90 with Moira's presence there and her very cool lightning bolt earrings. The direct build to Muir Island occurs across X-Factor 65 to 68 by Chris Claremont, Wills Portacio, and Jim Lee, literally right after Louise Simonson's final issue after a five-year run on the title. Long story short, this is the story where Apocalypse and his Dark Riders kidnap baby Nathan Christopher Summers from Scott Summers and Jean Grey, and although Apocalypse's plans for the child are seemingly thwarted, he infects baby Nathan with a techno-organic virus at the end of this, risking baby Nathan's life, okay? And what has to happen here, and I always get this plot confused with 1992's Executioner's Song, which will follow up on this plot, I'll say, but it's here that we see a mysterious visitor from the future come to rescue baby Nathan by taking him to the future where the techno-organic virus can be abated. Even though he's a pretty poor father in this era and an even worse, worse husband, not as bad as Professor X, but you know, that's pretty low bar, I'm touched by Claremont's writing of Cyclops here as he has to choose to give up his baby son in order to save his life. These seeds won't play into Muir Island, but what it does do is free up X-Factor where they don't have child responsibilities and sets the stage for the official final regathering of all of the X-Men, including the OGs here, right? The originals are on X-Factor, that is Cyclops, Jean Grey, Iceman, Warren Worthington, and Beast, okay? And, and what it does is it finally regathers all of those mutants and all of these X-Men after Chris Claremont and company had spread them far and wide across the Marvel Universe over the course of several years. In the pages of Uncanny X-Men, I think 275 to 277, we get a similar gathering of all the players, okay? Finally connecting with Professor X, who has been gallivanting in space with Empress Lalandra and the Shi'ar for flipping years since Uncanny X-Men 200. This is definitely one of those details I like to think about when we reconsider X history in the Hickman era of X-Men, but Professor X spent a lot of time in Shi'ar space, presumably maintaining plans he had made with Moira and maybe Magneto. This feels like the sort of detail that could and probably should come up. 
Most importantly, as we're reintroduced to the Professor and the Shi'ar, we see Prof seemingly working with the Starjammers in his Strife meets Jack Kirby Hats cosplay, and it's a glorious costume I'd like to see him bring back. Long story short, there's a Skrull masquerading as the Professor, and the visiting X-Men have to root out the Skrull infiltration before bringing Professor X back home to solve the growing problems on Muir Island. As always, anytime there's a period of a character's history where they were taken over by a Skrull imposter, you should take note. In case it wasn't clear that we are firmly in the 90s too, and rapidly approaching the image revolution in comics, we also get some wonderful dec declarations from Lila Cheney announcing herself and Deathstrike here as two bad beautiful babes with really big guns. In a sign of things to come, we do also see teased during this time Shinobi Shaw giving Papa Sebastian a heart attack and taking over the Hellfire Club in his new bid as one of the upstarts who will play a major role in post Claremont Uncanny X Men. This is definitely some relevant history that we see play out in the pages of the Dawn of X Marauders, where Sebastian Shaw is a council member in the Krakoa era and a leader of the Black King of, you know, the Marauders Hellfire Trading Company, and we see Shinobi Saw Shaw resurrected there and brought back and of course referencing this history as well. So for those of you who are curious where that starts, it can trace it through its back to the build and through the Muir Island saga, even though it's not a major part. Now, as mentioned in the intro, the Muir Island showdown is a clash between the Shadow King and the X-Men, primarily his hated rival Professor X, as established way back in the all-time classic Uncanny X-Men number 117 by Claremont, John Byrne, Terry Austin, and Tom Warzakowski. The Shadow King has plans here of basically powering up through the fear and hatred of mutant kind, using that psychic energy of hate and rage to make himself more powerful than he's ever been, okay? But what's interesting to me especially is we see Shadow King in the Jacob Rice guys talking too about this cosmic ambitions, okay? Why settle for just the Earth when I can claim the stars? Now, potentially, this is reference to the fact that Professor X had been out in space for a long time, and it's not really something that is heavily referenced as the event continues, but I find the cosmic ambitions of Shadow King, very, very interesting. This is something that I would very much like to see current X creators uh, revisit, frankly, because it's something that doesn't get touched on heavily enough here, but like what was Shadow King actually planning for the stars? That to me is an interesting conversation. Visually, we also see the full 90s-ification of Shadow King as Andy Kubert in particular gets started on the X-Men and really leans into the monstrous, toothy, venom-like aspects of the King's astral form. His plot here is effectively to power up through the world's collective hate and rage and reign supreme, whatever specifically that means yet again. Uh, the creative units, you know, throughout this Muir Island Saga 2, like, they change over constantly, okay, in a way that X-Men comics really have not for the longest time because of, you know, the consistency of the creators involved. But like on Uncanny, for example, 278, we have Claremont joined by ex-legend Paul Smith on art, Hilary Barta and Glennis Oliver as well. But then when we get to 279, now the plotting is split between Claremont, Jim Lee, Fabian DiCiesa coming on in scripting duties. And that's where we get Andy Cooper with Scott Williams inks. And then you have like Nicieza's role scripting, you know, through X Factor and Uncanny X-Men. You get Wills Portacio drawing some of these issues. And then by the time we hit the epilogue of X Factor 70, we have Peter David writing, right? So like as, as much as, you know, X X-Men comics from 1975 through like this right here, you basically are consistently saying like, well, there's one lock and that's Claremont and X-Men. That's actually changing here as he moves, you know, aside and is basically, you know, in some ways kind of cast aside for the Jim Lee and the Wills Portacio and these new up and coming creators. Now, the Shadow King is committed to destroying Professor X specifically, who cost him power in plotting when inhabiting the host Amal Farouk. The King's been setting the stage on Muir Island with basically all of the regular players under his influence in some form or another. I'll note here too the special and, in my opinion, confusing role of Lorna Dane Polaris, who Shadow King is using um, essentially as a vessel, uh, Banshee describes her as a nexus for, uh, for the Shadow King's plots, okay? We see similar influence over the world at large, with Shadow King dropping something akin to Jack Kirby's Mad Bomb from late 70s Captain America, if you've read those stories, basically bringing humanity's innate prejudices and hatred to the forefront, leading to riots, mobs, and, you know, some sickening violence. Shadow King is trying to prove that this is the real humanity, and to prove that Professor X's dreams of peaceful integration of mutants and humans are ultimately not possible. As the Shadow King says, your dream is shattered. You have lost. The world is mine. It's an interesting reflection, too, for Professor X. You know, again, we have not had, in this era of X-Men, many Professor X-focused stories, right? He's out in space with the 
Landry, we get little sneak peeks here and there, but we don't actually see much conversation from the vantage point of Professor X saying, you know, hey, we need to stick to the dream, remember the dream of peaceful integration of humans and mutants. And what we're doing is we're kind of getting back to that at this point in X-Men, kind of saying, okay, what was that dream again? What was the point? And Shadow King really puts that under trial in this saga. Now, before we progress to the final showdown on Muir Island, I do also want to touch base on the impact all this has on Moira McTaggart, given her tremendous relevance in the Hickman era of X-Men. I'd say here that if you're only interested in the Muir Island saga and don't want to hear much about what's going on with X-Men comics after 2019, skip ahead a couple minutes here because this is going to definitely talk about that. We never see anything in these issues from the perspective of Moira, okay? But instead, we see frequent reactions from her romantic partner, Sean Cassidy, Banshee, who is basically like a cartoon character going awooga awooga every time Moira shows up in her new all-leather form-fitting attire and her way more hands-on personality. Put simply, this era of Moira is trying to play up her id, right, a less restrained, cautious version of the geneticist and mutant ally we know, and instead wearing her emotions very openly. There's nothing particularly excessive about anything she does here, but Sean keeps thinking it feels very different from this woman he's known, and as readers, we know this is the influence of the Shadow King on Muir Island, which again has been growing over the course of many issues. Where we really see a jump is when the Muir Island saga officially begins, Moira is wearing her ancestral warrior wear, sitting on a throne and leading a coliseum-like series of battles, battle royales between the mutants on Muir Island. This is a bit of a jump <laughs> for the character so far. This is without question meant to show that the mutants are behaving violently, out of character, and his rogue, who is newer to the island after some time with Magneto in the Savage Land, and that's only partly a euphemism, wrestles, you know, with why she's participating in this type of ritualized violence, Moira's goading on the crowd, okay? Moira is all in on this. It is absolutely not lost on me how closely these scenes parallel what we've seen introduced in the Dawn of X in X-Men number 7 by uh, Jonathan Hickman and Lionel Francis Hugh, with Krakoa's Crucible. I mean, this is very much a prelude to Crucible, where we have mutants fighting in an arena, cheered on by other mutants, and and loving it. Um, it, it definitely, I think, does for readers who are in this era of the post-House and Powers Hickman era of X-Men, looking at Crucible saying, these aren't even these aren't the mutants I remember there what is happening there's something wrong um which is which is a question Nightcrawler is asking actually in the way of X I think these scenes in Muir Island definitely sort of echo that point because that is a hundred percent what they are meant to convey which is to say there's something wrong here <laughs> right uh but it does lack the purpose of Crucible potentially too so you have to wrestle with that now I think big picture, like we need to see this time period revisited from Moira's perspective in the current era. I would love to know what Moira was thinking or what she thinks now about the fact that she was possessed or seemingly under the influence of the Shadow King. Would they, would creators today dealing with Moira and how big a character she is in the X-Men line currently, would they potentially say, oh, that was the Shi'ar Golem, right? That was that was not the real version, and actually she was plotting and planning. Is this something that has happened in other iterations of Moira previously, or is this an all-new thing that was unanticipated and and was a risk to their to their great plans, right? That Moira, Professor X, and Magneto are forming. I think if um if we're going to revisit sort of the history of this character, the history of Moira through the lens of what we know after House and Powers of Ten. This to me is actually one of, if not the most interesting Moira story. I would actually say this and then X-Men number one to number three, the Mutant Genesis 1991 that I'm going to talk about in the next Cracking Krakoa. Those stories, the Moira's perspective on them now is completely fascinating to me. Like what does she make of the Shadow King's presence, the Shadow King's influence, what the Shadow King was able to do on Muir Island. Those, to me, feel like really, really interesting stories in the current setting. So, back to the Muir Island saga, Shadow King turns the feared and hunted back on Professor X, sending in, to this point, Amnesiac Colossus to kill him at the restored X Mansion. Professor X, he is able to ultimately, you know, escape um, Colossus through the help of Stevie Hunter, who returns here after some time away, and he is also able to, you know, not only free Peter from the influences of the Shadow King, who is driving him to be this murderous, violent, you know, Colossus, but he also restores the memories of who Colossus is. You know, this is uh, all of the X-Men in this era. They go through the Siege Perilous, not all of them, but many of them go through the Siege Perilous, and they sort of lose who they are for a time, many of them. Uh, Colossus, this actually lasts 
I think technically the longest of anyone. Um, he becomes uh, a, a really kindly artist and painter during this era and is like actually pretty happy with his life. But uh, Professor X has to restore, you know, his mind of who he is and, and the fact that he's a mutant and that he's an X-Man. So as the unimpacted X-Men teams head to Mirror Island to stop Shadow King, they quickly run into the greatest threat there, which is Professor X's Omega level mutant son, Legion, who is basically possessed by the Shadow King here into doing his bidding, into striking out as um, Legion says here, he's making me hurt people. This is one of the earliest iterations we see of the full threat Legion possesses, um, you know, to the X-Men or, 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 you know, poses to the X-Men and mutant kind, right? Like we, we don't actually see a lot of Legion using his powers because, you know, in the intro and in the, the classic between uh, Chris Claremont and Bill Sienkiewicz story, that's more about dealing with the psyche of Legion and kind of what is going on within his, within his mind, of course, and the different characters that sort of inhabit that space. Um, but here we actually see Legion striking out and we see that like, yeah, he can kind of hold the entirety of the X-Men at bay by himself like that is how powerful this character is now in his hatred of charles shadow king gets the double whammy of using legion's immense power and striking out at professor x's son right so the only way charlie can strike out is at his own child it's a smart play cementing the hatred between these two characters and when we talk about you know, who are the who are the mutants that would be the least welcome <laughs> in in a mutant uh, space, you know, controlled by Professor X. This is why the Shadow King is so high on that list, right? And any and any mutants or individuals that uh, the Shadow King entity might inhabit. I mean, they are absolutely arch enemies. I mean, I think a lot of times when people talk about, okay, who's Professor X's enemy? They talk about Magneto, but that is, you know, that, that relationship is obviously so complicated because they're friends first. They just differ politically or, or philosophically. Um, um, Shadow King, actual enemy, <laughs> right? There is no love lost between these individuals. Now, in some of my favorite visuals, the Shadow King and an armored up Professor Rex wage war on the astral plane. I do quite love it when we get the giant monstrous Shadow King versus the armored knight-like Professor X fighting on the astral plane. Uh, it brings back to me memories of playing Marvel Ultimate Alliance, which is, of course, a classic in my view. I do enjoy, too, seeing how Shadow King really forces Professor X to call his dream to call the dream into question. You know, it really makes Professor X ask questions about, you know, what is it effective? Can it work? As he says, if anger, despair, and hatred can become this powerful, what does that say about my dream, my way of trying to bring light and hope to the world? These are interesting questions to continue asking about what Professor X is trying to do between mutant kind and humanity, even if, of course, at the end of the day, the Shadow King's influence is not one to be trusted. Ultimately, this sets the stage for Professor X's victory over Shadow King, but at great cost, at the cost of the use of his legs and with the impact of, at the time, sending Legion, his son, into a catatonic state, which definitely hits Professor X very hard here, as it should. At not insignificant risk to himself, Professor X returns immediately to Legion's mindscape to try to help his son, but the damage is done. To the point that Professor X, you know, he tries. He fights in the, in the mindscape trying to free Legion, trying to bring him back, but ultimately he can't do it, and he has to say goodbye. For all we know at this point, Legion is effectively dead, you know, at the end of the Muir Island saga. He just, it, Professor X, you know, and again, here he's trying. He's actually trying, but he just fails Legion at almost every turn, you know, and this is why this moment, particularly the Muir Island saga, are actually some of Professor X's better moments as a father, right? Like he is, he again, like he is making an effort. He is making an effort at risk to his own health. Um, but again, he's just not there for Legion, um, hardly ever when he needs him. And, uh, and, and, you know, it's something that will come back to haunt him and, and continues to. On an unrelated but very important story note, while in the hospital room, while Professor X is working on Legion's psyche, Mario McTaggart asks Wolverine to put out a cigarette, which he promptly does by swallowing it using nothing but his tongue and teeth. I'm just going to let that linger there for a moment. In the aftermath of the Muir Island saga, it's worth calling out how the Shadow King corrupts and perverts what the hope of Muir Island was. As Lorna Dane puts it, it seemed such a safe place, a haven. Here was research, study, intellectualism. Muir Island was a source of solutions, not problems. And the Shadow King's evil greatly disrupts that hope. You know, it really sort of dissolves what the potential of Muir Island was, or at least it seems to, for a time. And, and it's, again, a very interesting thing to consider in retrospect, given what we know about 
post House and Powers Moira, and you know probably what is actually going on on Muir Island. What did the Shadow King's influence really disrupt? You know, it's part of why I find this saga so fascinating in retrospect. Muir Island sets the core for creative lineup changes in the relaunched X-Men by Claremont and Lee, which I'll cover in an upcoming episode of Kraken and Krakoa, and in X-Factor, where writer Peter David and artist Larry Stroman began their long run on a new team lineup, primarily of Havoc, Polaris, Guido, Multiple Man, Wolfsbane, and Quicksilver, replacing uh, Freedom Force, you know, the, the governmental agency that was comprised mostly of former X or mutant villains, okay? So you get some new series out of it, and again, you get the gathering of mutant kind. They're all back, you know, there's really sort of a a reiteration of Professor X's dream for the new era, for the 1990s, and that's where kind of X-Men comics go from here, as we'll talk about. All in all, Mural and Saga, again, it's overlooked for a reason, I think. When you look at it just as the light crossover, it's not necessarily that stellar, but when you consider the build to it, you consider what's happening now, and again, especially when you consider the surprising relevance that it has to what's going on in X-Men comics today, I find it a really interesting reread. Um, if you're interested in reading along with comics like these, you know, as we go through a reading club and podcast, check out My Marvelous Year. Okay, you can find us at My Marvelous Year on social. Um, just look for the My Marvelous Year podcast and any of your podcast players. It's a reading club where we read through a curated list of the best Marvel comics from its origins to today. And, you know, recently we're, we're right up, uh, we're recording through like 1991 right now. Okay, so we just read and recorded an episode on the Mural Island Saga. You'll get all sorts of coverage on X-Men comics there as well as the rest of the Marvel Universe. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Dave. The ways you can support Comic Book Herald and the YouTube channel, uh, you can do so via patreon.com slash comic book herald. All support is tremendously appreciated and helps encourage me to continue making content just like this. Uh, in particular, I want to thank our mysterious benefactors tier. Those of you who contribute at a level where you get your name added to the videos. Thank you, Jesse W., Megan Getman, Cole Weathers, Martin Lopez, Brent Bowser, Professor X3769, Richard Renz, Verisimilitude, Terra Nort, Ed Mackey, Clyde DeGlide, Pinball Drew, Mike Solomons, Matt Mahoney, and John Samander. Thank you very much. Again, I'm Dave. You can find my stuff at Comic Book Herald on social, comicbookherald.com online, and look for the best comics ever in my Marvelous Year podcast for more from me. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and as always, enjoy the comics.